And if you'll turn with me in your Bibles now, we're, we're still in Genesis. Genesis chapter 46, beginning with verse 1, reading from the New Living Translation of the Scriptures. The word of the Lord is as follows. So Jacob set out for Egypt with all his possessions. And when he came to Beersheba, he offered sacrifices to the God of his father, Isaac. During the night, God spoke to him in a vision. Jacob, Jacob, he called. Here I am, Jacob replied. I am God, the God of your father, the voice said. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for there I will make your family into a great nation. I will go with you down to Egypt, and I will bring you back again. You will die in Egypt, but Joseph will be with you to close your eyes. So Jacob left Beersheba, and his sons took him to Egypt. They carried him and their little ones and their wives in the wagons Pharaoh had provided for them. Thus far, the word of the Lord. You may be seated. During the night, God spoke to him, being Jacob in a vision. Jacob, Jacob, he called. Here I am, Jacob replied. I am the God of your father, the voice said. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for there I will make your family into a great nation. I will go with you down to Egypt. I will bring you back again. You will die, but Joseph will be with you to close your eyes. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for there I will make your family into a great nation. I want you to look at somebody and just tell them, go there. Go there. Transition of any kind can be a scary thing. Moving from one place to another, one position to another, one person to another, one status to another, moving from one process to another, one task to another, one plan to another, any of those and all of those can be quite stressful. To go, from un to go from employed to unemployed, from single to married, from married to divorced or widowed, from the supervised to the supervisor or vice versa. To go from being settled to transient or transient to settled. To go from being known to unknown or unknown to more known. Any and all of those are stressful things. To graduate from high school and then to be forced to move and to go into college. Or to graduate from college and now have to find a job. Or to have worked for a place or places for 30 or 40 years and to now be retired. All of those carry their own levels of stress. Transitions are stressful because they are disruptive. They are dislocating. They disrupt who you are and what you know. They dislocate you in terms of identity, agency, and purpose. When you're in the midst of a transition of any kind, you find yourself asking questions such as, who am I now? Upon what can I depend to be true? What do I do now? And who will be with me now that I'm where I am? And while that is the case for anyone, the older that you are, the more frightening and stressful transition can be. The combination of age with the length of time of being in one place or in one position or operating at one pace, one process with the same people, as you age, it gives a predictability. It gives safety. It gives security that is threatened by the mere thought of any of it changing. The truth of the adage that you can't teach an old dog new tricks is not that an old dog is incapable of learning new tricks. It is just that what is required is perceived by the old dog to be too steep a climb 
or too high a price that the dog is willing to pay. For an old dog, better to die with what it knows than to risk with living with the unknown. That's what that adage really means. And that is where we find Jacob at the point of our text. Jacob is not the young man who tricked his brother out of birthright and blessing. But Jacob is now well up in age. He's a senior pace setter, if you will. And for some time now, he has dwelt in land promised first to his grandfather, Abraham, and reaffirmed to his daddy named Isaac. And Jacob now finds himself at a point of transition. This point of transition for Jacob is not one of choice. It is one of necessity. While he's living in the land promised by God first to his grandfather, Abraham, and then to his father, Isaac, and more recently to him, he is now forced to leave the land that was promised to be theirs. It is not by choice, it is by, by force. A regional famine has hit, and the only place that was prepared for the famine was Egypt. Initially, he had sent his sons to Egypt to secure supplies to endure the famine where they were. And while that worked for a while, what they had received didn't last very long. More importantly, there was someone in Egypt whose presence made Jacob's journey equally necessary. Ja Jacob's son that he, that he really loved, the firstborn to the wife that he really loved, named Rachel, the son named Joseph. Joseph was in Egypt. And he wasn't just in Egypt. Joseph was bawling in Egypt. He was shot calling in Egypt. He was second to only Pharaoh. And as any concerned son would do, Joseph has now sent for daddy to come live where he is. While Jacob mentally may have known that Egypt was the best scenario for him and the family, emotionally, he was not feeling it at all. He was not feeling leaving his home, what he knew, where he was known. Anybody know where Jacob is? Anybody ever had that experience? I, I experienced that in 2007 after several hospitalizations in Washington, D.C. due to diabetic episodes, due to noncompliance. It was clear that, that my dad, Claude Sr., could not live in D.C. alone. Everybody knew that it was the best course of action for him to move to Charlotte to be with us. And after months of conjoling, he finally conceded. It, it was in the month of February. It was a mental concession in 2007. We, we had him packed. We, we sent T-Mac up there to, to get him on the plane, and, and we had trouble at the airport getting him on the flight, and... Then once he got on the flight, he started having these, these episodes, and, and no sooner than the plan landed, his blood pressure was so high, we had to take him straight to the hospital where he stayed for a whole week. You see, what he knew mentally, he could not accept emotionally. And he eventually accepted it and later embraced it, and he lived here until he died in July of 2000 and 13. Transitions are difficult. They are disruptive and they are dislocating. And the older that you are, the, the harder that, that it is. There Jacob is approaching a transition that he mentally concedes, but he emotionally fears. His bags are packed. His donkeys are loaded externally. He looks ready, but internally he is a wreck. Somebody knows what it is to have yourself externally together, but internally you are anything but together. Your mind is racing. Your, your nerves are shot. Your spirit is unsettled. And everybody around you may be thinking how good this is going to be, but you are having second, third, or even fourth thoughts. Do you see, Jacob? as he is traveling as far as Beersheba, where he offers sacrifices to God. He's worshiping externally, but he's worried internally. 
And later that night, the Lord speaks to Jacob in a dream. Can I, can I, can I, can I pause for a moment of station identification? Because there are some of you who are dealing with aging parents right now. Somebody, somebody here at South Charlotte, somebody at Beatty's Ford Road, somebody at Independence, you are, you are dealing with aging parents and the necessity of moving them from one place to another. It may be from, from their place to yours, or it may be from your place to somewhere where they can get better, better treatment and care, be in a better environment for, for where they are in their lives. And your parents are feeling some kind of way, and you don't know what to do. You don't know what to say. And like Joseph with Jacob, you are trying the best to do the best that you can, to do the most that you can for them but they aren't feeling it. This story gives you a word of hope. And the word that God gives for you right now dealing with that aging parent is trust God to speak to them in ways that you cannot. That that the God who's been with them longer than you have is the God who is able to talk to them in ways that that you are unable to talk. That night, that night, not, not Judah, not, not Simeon, not, not Reuben, not Naphtali, not Gad, not, not Asher, not, not Joseph by way of email, but the Lord himself talks to Jacob. And in the vision, the Lord calls Jacob by name, and Jacob signals his attention by saying, here I am. That is an important thing because so very often God calls our names, but we don't give him our attention. Here I am, here I am, says God, you have my attention. Sometimes we are distracted by by other things. Other times we really don't want to be bothered with what God has on his mind, but not so with Jacob. Jacob just says, here I am. With God seeking to speak to you today, does he have your attention right now? Not do I have your attention, but does God have your attention? Look at your neighbor and say, are you here? (laughs) Are you mentally here? Is your attention here? Is your focus here? Because when God speaks, God, God wants to have our attention because guess what? God never speaks an empty word. And so Jacob says, yes, here I am, here I am, God, you have, you have my attention, you have, you have my focus, you, 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 have, you have my concentration. And, and God starts speaking to him first by not talking about Jacob, God talks about himself first. He says, I am the God of your father. God of Abraham and the God, God, God of Isaac. God identifies himself in terms of covenant continuity. He says he is the God whose work with Jacob began before Jacob. Before Jacob, there was God showing himself to be true to his promise to his grandfather Abraham and Sarah that they would produce a son in their old age. Before Jacob, there was the occasion at Mount Moriah where God provided a ram in the bush to spare Isaac from being physically sacrificed. The God who was covenantally continuous with with his father Isaac is the God who has been and is, uh, desires to be with Jacob. He is the God who has spoken to him before and he is the God who speaks to him now. Whenever you are wrestling with the notion of a transition of any kind, you better put that transition in the right frame. Whatever transition or change you may be facing, it is done within the continuum of God's consistent purpose and plan. Because friends, the God who is God is the God who is covenantally continuous. I I put that adjective, covenantally continuous, because there are those who can continue with their you, but they do not continue keeping their promises. But the God who is with you is covenantally continuous. The reason why he continues with you is because he made a promise to himself first. And then he made a promise to you. And the work with you began before you. It began with others before you. 
It began with promises before you. It began with promise prayers made and prayers answered before you. It, it began with breakthroughs and miracles before you. It began with transitions made and endured before you. You aren't the only one in the continuum of your story who's had transitions to face, who's had obstacles to overcome, who's had difficulties uh, to face. You aren't the first to feel some kind of way about what God is doing, how God is doing it, how long it is taking God to do what God is doing, where God is requiring you to do go, what God is asking you to give up. Guess what? But it didn't start with you. Those before you, your mama, your grandmama, your grandfather, your great grandparents, they had to face some of the same stuff. And the God who kept covenant with them, who did things for his name's sake in their lives, is the God who speaks to you. He is the God who is covenantally continuous. And as that was for Jacob, that was also the case for Jacob's seed. That was Joseph's experience. And I don't know about you, but that should be good news for all of us. Because the God who anchors his word and work in my life by his covenantal continuity is the God who not only did the same for my parents and grandparents and great-grandparents, but he is also the God who will do the same for my children and my children's children and their children. I can trust my children to God's continuity. I can believe God to keep and care for them out of a sense of the continuity of the purpose that he has, not just for me, but that he has for my line. That there is a story that God is fulfilling that began before me, that includes me, and that extends to those who come after me. I'm talking to somebody right now who is dealing with something, not with your parent, you're dealing with your child. And I want you to understand that the God who was covenantally continuous with your parents and with you, that same God will be also for your children. I wonder if I have a witness who can say, I've seen him take care of my children. I've seen him work things out for my children. I've seen him do things that I could not do for them. But when I put them in the hands of Almighty God, the God who was covenantally continuous was me. He was also there with my child. To an anxious and fearful Jacob, the Lord says, do not be afraid to go down to Egypt. For there I will make your family into a great nation. The Lord tells Jacob, go there. That is the place he's afraid to go. Go down there. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know who, who I'm aiming at, but I'm aiming at somebody and you're feeling it right now. God is speaking to you and he's saying, go there. Whether, whether, whether your point of transition is, is a place, whether your point of transition is a position, whether your point of transition is a process, God is telling you, you got to do something differently. Whether your point of transition is people, God is saying you need to, you need to uh, get with some other people. Whether your transition is a point of relationship status, a way of thinking, a way of practice, God is telling you, go there. And the question is, how do you lean into a point of transition that disrupts and dislocates you that 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 stops your flow <laughs> that 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 redirects you in ways that you did not see yourself being redirected how do you how do you lean in to that and 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 and, and not do it begrudgingly but how how do you embrace god telling you Go there. Well, number one, go there assured of the preparations that's been made. Tell your neighbor he's made preparations. Part of Jacob's apprehension is not knowing what to expect because he hadn't been where he's going. His going down to Egypt, however, is not contingent upon his having been there before or upon the preparations that he's made. No, it's based upon who's been in Egypt and the preparations that have been made for 
Jacob. You know, you know somebody's been in Egypt for a while. And Joseph, Joseph has been in Egypt and Joseph has been making preparations for Jacob. In fact, God sent Joseph ahead to be in place when Jacob would need Joseph the most. And with Joseph in place, God prepared Egypt for Jacob's arrival. Friends, when it comes to living out the God purpose in your life and the transitions that come your way, the issue is not the preparation you've made. The issue is preparations that God has made for you. And when you are worried about never having been to a place, operating in a position, working with a process, being among the people or being without the people, you need to know that God is already in the place, at the position, with the process, and among the people, God is already there working on what is needed for you to arrive. Whatever changes the Lord is seeking to make in your life, you need to understand that God is saying to you, preparations have already been made. People are awaiting you. Opportunities are awaiting you. Doors, open windows are already awaiting you. Preparations have already been made. But there's something else and something else. It, it go there, encouraged by God's purpose to extend you. To extend you. You see, another part of Jacob's fear may be that in his mind, this is a step down. This is a step away from the promise of God. You see, you, gotta, you, gotta, you, you have to have paid attention if you're reading the Bible by way of the flow. Jacob is leaving the land of promise to go down into Egypt. Let that settle in now. His grandfather left where he was based upon a promise that God made that he and his seed would have land. Jacob has been living in a part of that land. And now God is telling Jacob, don't be afraid to leave what I promised you. Lord have mercy. Uh, he's moving away from and going down to. You got you to gotta, you gotta pay attention when you're reading the Bible. This could be seen as contradictory. It could be viewed as a threat to what not just he believed, what his daddy believed. Not just what his daddy believed, what Big Papa believed. And that's why the Lord says, for there I will make your family into a great nation. You see, the, 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 the promise that God made to Abraham wasn't just about land. It was also about seed, <laughs> that God would multiply his seed and make him into a great nation. Not, not just that they'd have property, but that they would have lineage and line. And God says, down there, that's where I'm going to make you into a great nation. In a time of disruption and a period of displacement, God speaks of extending Jacob's line. That they wouldn't be made into a great nation in the promised land. No, no. No, no. They're going to be made into a great nation outside of the promised land. There in, in Egypt. That's where, that's where I'm going to move your family from the status of simply families. But down in Egypt, I'm going to turn them into tribes. And then I'm not only going to make them a tribes, a set of tribes, I'm going to constitute a nation that is as disruptive as it may feel, Jacob, 
And as displacing as it may seem, God has purposed it for extension. God has purposed it for growth. God has established it for acceleration. Somebody just got your email, didn't you? Your disruption and displacement is for your extension. It's in this time of transition where you feel out of sorts and out of place that God has purpose to grow you, to increase you, to extend you, to multiply you. It's, it's the place that you call strange that God says he's strengthening you. It's in the period of dislocation and even perhaps dismissal that God says, I've set that for your development and your deepening. It's in the season where you feel lost that God says, I've set up for, your, for you to be lengthened and for you to be enlarged. Oh, Lord, have this purposed extension in a place of disruption and dislocation would also be within the context of difficulty. Tell your neighbor, I might not want to hear this part, so I might check out and then check back in a little later. Notice, if you will, God tells Jacob, you're going to die there. That, that, is, that, is, that is to say, Jacob, this ain't going to be a short stay where you're going to be in and out, and you're going to come back to the land of... No, no, you're going to die in Egypt. Not only will Jacob die in Egypt, guess who else will die in Egypt? Joseph will die in Egypt. And with their deaths in Egypt, a new Pharaoh would arise who neither knew Joseph nor Joseph's importance to Egypt. And this new Pharaoh's ignorance would be coupled with a fear of the Hebrew people causing him to see them as enemies in need of being neutralizing. And this would result in ordering taskmasters to bitterly afflict them. But if you, but if you know the story, you'll, you'll, you'll understand that the more that they were afflicted, the more that they multiplied. The harder the pressure, the greater their productivity. That God would use the attempts to minimize them to be the very soil of their multiplication. That it was in their affliction that they were made into a great nation. Lord, have mercy. Their, their, their greatness did not come during a time of ease and a season where there were no problems. No, it was in the midst of hardship, hard affliction that God said, I'm going to grow you right there. Friends, as disruptive and as dislocating as transitions may be, understand this from the word of God. I'm not preaching pop psychology. I'm preaching the Bible now. God can use your disruption and your dislocation to, to use it for great purposes in your life. God used Joseph's disruption and dislocation to put Joseph in the position for greatness. He used Esther's disruption and dislocation to put her in a position for greatness. He used Nehemiah being the cupbearer of Artaxerxes to position him for greatness. And I know, I know somebody, you're not feeling this because you don't feel great, but can I punch you between the eyes? Greatness is not a feeling. Greatness is a destiny. Uh, Lord have mercy. And when you live your life according to God's purposes uh, and you start experiencing transition that is disrupting and dislocating, God says uh, he will use it for greatness. Uh, greatness in character. Greatness in faith. Uh, greatness in prayer. Greatness in worship. Uh, greatness in your witness. Uh, the power in your testimony is in what you've endured, what you've faced, what you've carried, what you've overcome, what you've withstood, how you overcame, how you didn't lose it all, how you recovered, how 
you came back. When people look at you and you start telling them the truth about your real story, that you ain't always had it easy and life ain't always been good, and you start talking about the real difficulties, the real struggles, the real trials, the real tragedies in your life, and then they look at you and you look in the way that you look, you act in the way that you act, they say, oh my God, how did you do it? And you're able to tell them it was not me. It was a God who was on my side. It was a God who was with me. Lord have mercy and I don't know who I'm talking to but can I plant a, can I plant one seed in your mind right now it's the word great uh, I see something great for you I see something mighty for you I see something exceptional for you I see something extraordinary for you I see something major for you can you slap fire with your neighbor and just tell them great 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 and can I hit you with a law of mathematics for every action there is a reaction which means as great as your difficulty may be as great as your struggle may be as great as your trial may be God says I've got something equally great on the other side great 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 I'm going I'm going to I'm going to there that there, there is where I'm going to extend you there is where I'm going to make you great. But, but now, friends, i got to tell you, in order for you to reach that destiny, you got to decide to go there. That is to say, there are steps for you to take. There are moves for you to make. There are habits for you to break. There are people you got to shake loose from your life if you're going to get that destiny. I'll slap that with your neighbor and tell them, go there anyhow. Whoever you got to shake loose, shake them loose. Whatever you got to break, break it. Whatever, whatever step you got to take, whatever move you got to make, you better go there because God says, I got greatness. I got greatness right there. I got greatness. We, we lean into times of transition. Not only by being assured of preparations that have been made ahead of us. Not, not just being assured that, that God wants to extend us. You, you, you know, you can only grow by being stretched. You, 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 you grow tall by your tendons and ligaments being stretched. And, and, and growing pains is, is often when your tendons are being stretched so quickly that they rub against the bone. And it, and it causes you pain, but you don't understand that's how I'm being extended. Oh, Lord, have mercy. You don't need another pill to pop. You just need a change of thinking in your mind when you understand that if you're going through some stretching, it's because God is trying to extend you. And the mental pain that you may be feeling, you, not, you got to replace that with a better thought and say, God is making me bigger and better and larger and stronger than I have ever been to be to be stretched, to be stretched, to be stretched. But then, but then there's one more thing, and that is God's promised company to face what we fear. As Jacob is traveling towards, towards Egypt, he's well aware of his age. I mean, he's a pace setter, senior pace setter. He's president of the pace setters. And, 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 and in his mind, he's thinking, I'm, I could die in Egypt. That, that, that I might not get back to the promised land alive. I, I, might, I, might, I, might, I might not see what was promised to me again. And... and, and, and and God is cognizant of the dimensions of concern that Jacob has. And, and, and God says, yeah, yes, 
He says, I'll go down with you to Egypt. I will bring you back again. Yes, you will die in Egypt. But Joseph will be with you to close your eyes. Oh, my. Uh, uh, Jacob, you're not traveling by yourself. I, I, I'm with you in this, in this journey down to Egypt. And, and when you get there, not only am I going to be there, but, but that son that you love, the one that, that, that you thought was dead, the one for whom you gave a coat of many colors, he, he's going to be there with you in Egypt. And, and when you've got to face even death, you're not going to be by yourself because I'm going to be there and I'm going to provide Joseph to be right there, to be with you, to, to close your eyes when he must face what he fears the most. God tells him, you don't need to be afraid because you will not be by yourself. You will have company. Joseph will be there to close your eyes. The very last face you'll see on earth, Jacob, will be Joseph's face. And the very first face you see on the other side will be my face. And so you need not fear letting go. And you need not fear where you're going because you're going to see a lovely face face when you leave and you're going to see an even lovelier face when you arrive. Friends in every transition there is this fear of isolation. There is this fear of aloneness. There's this fear who's going to be with you? Who's going to be on your side? And the good news for the believer is that there is company that God promises and there's company that God provides. And God doesn't just promise human company, but God promises his company. God promises to be with those whom God loves. And there is no point of transition transition where you will ever be totally alone because when nobody else is there the Lord promises to be by your side he promises never to leave you nor to forsake you David David testifies when mother and father forsake me the Lord will take me up he testifies yea though I walk because there are some things you got to walk by yourself yea though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death I'll fear no evil why because the Lord is with me his rod and his staff they come for me. The Lord prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. The Lord anoints my head with oil. The Lord causes my cup to run over. Surely goodness and mercy will be following me all the days of my life and I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The Lord promises to be with you though there is the promised company of the Lord to face whatever you've got to face whatever comes your way whether it's unexpected or expected, the Lord says, I got you and I've got this. And friends, you aren't the only one to ever have to face dislocating and disrupting transitions. It was not just Jacob. It was not just Joseph. But there's somebody else who had to face disruption and dislocation. He is the very Lord Jesus himself. Can you hear him in John chapter 16? verse 32 when he says indeed the hour is coming and is now come that you all will be scattered each unto his own and you will leave me alone and yet I'm not alone because the father is with me these things have I spoken unto you that in me you may have peace in this world you will have tribulation you will have disruption you will have dislocation you will will have trial. You will have trauma. You will have tragedy in this world as long as you are breathing and alive. You will have this. But look at what Jesus says. But be of good cheer. 
I have overcome the world. The one who is with you has overcome anything that you will face, any changes that you will face. That's why he can go to Gethsemane and pray hard to sweat poured like drops of blood. That's why he can face betrayal. That's why he can face the trial before Pilate and Herod. That's why he can face the hill called Calvary. That's why he can take nails in his wrist and nails in his feet and be hinged to a cross and be raised up above the earth and have gravity pull his body down. That's why he could bear our sins. That's why he could be wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquity and chastened for our peace and have stripes for our healing. That's why he could give up the ghost. That's why he could die and be buried because he knew he was not alone. That even when he had to make his bed in hell, my God, the Father would be right there with him and raise him on the third day morning with all power in his hand and see that resurrected Jesus give us the same promise and lo I'm with you always even to the end of the age Paul will testify that when he faced a dislocation when he faced disruption he said at my first defense when I had to stand for the faith nobody stood with me I had to stand by myself everybody forsook me he said but I pray God that it be not laid to their charge and then he hooked this word notwithstanding nevertheless in spite of what I just said there is another truth that is equally true yes everybody human left me but he says the Lord stood with me and the Lord strengthened me that the message might be fully preached to the Gentiles and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion and the Lord shall deliver me from every evil and the Lord will preserve me until the coming of his kingdom to him be glory forever and ever slap five with your neighbor and say neighbor I got company I got somebody on my side there is company for whatever I fear and no matter where you are he will be there no matter what you face he will be there no matter what you got to carry he will be there I wonder am I talking to anybody is there anybody here at South Charlotte anybody at Betty's Fort Road anybody at Independence who can testify he's been with you he's been with you in trials he's been with you in trouble he's been with you in trauma he's been with you in tragedy he's been with you in mistakes he's been with you in mishaps he's been with you in darkness he's been with you in difficulty he's been with you in disease he's been with you when you had to stand on the banks of the Jordan River and say your final goodbye to those whom you loved he was with you to dry your tears he was with you to hear your cry he was with you to lift up your head is there anybody who can testify he was with me and he's with me right now he's with me in my ups and my downs he's with me in my ins and my outs he's with me in my highs and my lows he's with me when I got a crowd and he's with me when I'm all by myself he's with me when I feel happy he's with me when I feel sad he's with me when I have my doubts he's with me when I have my fears I can say I'm never alone I'm never by myself and I don't have to worry because I'm never alone why because he walks with me he talks with me he tells me that I'm his own there's company there's company there's company there's company there's company for you and there's company for yours that's the good thing about knowing the God who is covenantally continuous is the God who can be with me is a God who'll be with my child even when I'm miles away from them. And he's with us at the same time attending to everything that we both need, not leaving anything unmet because that is the kind of God we serve. 